It's your old pal Mike. I hope you're happy, healthy, and safe. And welcome back to the channel because it's finally time to do something that I have been waiting to do for ages, months in fact. And I've been teasing that this was coming down the pike uh, for quite a while. So I hope that you're as excited as I currently am. We'll see if I'm still excited by the end of this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are going to be reviewing and demoing the Fender American Pro 2 Jazzmaster. Oh, and I'm so excited. I cannot wait to really dig into this thing. Now, this is a guitar that I have been wanting to review and demo ever since I first met one in the fall of 2020. And Fender, well, they finally sent me one. It only took a year because of supply chain and pandemic issues. That's okay, no big deal, I get it. Uh, but now I've got one and I'm excited to dig in and tell you all about it. But before we get into the meat of this review, I wanna give a shout out to my supporters on Patreon who were so good to help me with this video. Over on Patreon, I posted the outline and then the script to gather feedback from people who are just as invested in this channel as I am. I can't thank you enough for your support, your patience, your love, and your kindness. I think we made something really special together. If you would like to join the Patreon and support what the channel is doing, there are links in the description down below. Pro 2 is an exciting and welcome update to the American Professional series, and dare I say, a far more inspiring instrument as well. Now, it's no secret that I did not enjoy the original Professional series when it first hit, so to understand what I think Fender got so, so right with the Pro 2, we're gonna have to go back and take a look at the Pro 1. After a leak from an overseas dealer, Fender officially announced and released the American Professional lineup back in 2017, and initially, I was very excited. An intentionally streamlined entry into the offset catalog, the first Pro omitted some features in order to hit its price point of $14.99. Gone was the rhythm circuit, and while I understand that not everybody uses it, and that's totally fine, it is an essential feature for myself, but hey, I'm a big boy, I can live without it, but in its place was the three-way pickup selector switch. The guitars came in an array of colors, including white, sunburst, sonic gray, and my favorite of them all, Mystic Seafoam. There were also a few custom color runs, including Candy Apple Red, Shell Pink and Sky Blue Metallic with a solid rosewood neck, a limited silver burst edition, and even a pine-bodied version. Gray and Seafoam also came with another design tweak in the form of gloss maple fretboards, which is a feature not really offered on offsets since they first hit the market in 58, only available in custom orders. The spec sheets boasted of a new Mustang style bridge with nylon inserts that prevented it from rocking back and forth as you use the vibrato. And speaking of the vibrato, it now had a screw in arm. Now the biggest question mark for me were those pickups. The new Fender V mods were designed by Michael Frank, the person responsible for the Eric Johnson pickups, which are by all accounts, a great set. I have to say I was intrigued, yet very cautious. What excited me the most about the new Pro Series was that Fender was introducing a stripped down yet more affordable version of the Jazzmaster, which seems like the perfect thing to introduce new players to my favorite guitar. Now Fender, 
I have to give them credit, they graciously sent me one back in 2017 to see what I thought. And after a brief honeymoon period, well, I have to be honest, the disappointment started creeping in. It's certainly true that I miss the stripped out features like the rhythm circuit. I really do depend on that for a lot of tonal color. However, if I wanted to mod back in any of the things they took out, well, it was gonna take a lot of work because the routing of the body had changed drastically. If, for instance, I wanted to move the toggle switch back from the upper horn to the lower bout, that was gonna take extensive routing. I found the new switch location particularly frustrating and tough to get used to. I don't mind the idea of moving the switch on paper, but in practice, why did it have to go there? I mean, Squire got this right with their 2011 original vintage modified run, but where they put it on the original American professional run was unworkable for me. If I strummed anywhere near the neck or the neck pickup, I was gonna switch pickups whether I wanted to or not. It, it was incredibly uncomfortable. Oh, and curiously, every single one of these that I've encountered in the wild had the knobs oriented in such a way that five and six were staring up at the player uh, when rolled completely up. Uh, which is kind of weird and probably an attempt to get volume and tone to line up, but I, I don't know, at what cost? Like 10 should absolutely be facing me and that, that was a little weird. Now at the end of the day, these were relatively minor complaints, but my real disappointments with the model were much more fundamental. Take the vibrato for example. The original pro vibrato had a screw in arm which was an attempt to address the many complaints that folks had about their arms falling out or not staying put and on paper, it seems like a workable solution. However, in practice, <laughs> those arms were the loudest things I had ever used in my life. Anytime I rotated the arm, I could hear the, 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 the crunch, the crackle, the sound of the threaded collet rubbing against the arm. And, oh, <sighs> honest to God, it ruined takes in the studio. I tried to use that guitar so many times and I'd hear complaints from the engineer about all the extra noise they were getting, so that was not good. Uh, and lubrication did not seem to really help all that much. The other complaint that I had about the screw-in collet was that if you threaded it the whole way in, as you often do with a Strat, it would stay perfectly in place. Now that was good, however, when it was at the end of its thread, I mean, there was no way to get that arm out of the way when you were playing. If you were strumming and the arm stopped here, that's it. So yeah, definitely not my favorite version of the arm and collet assembly. Now the initial run of pros also had another flaw that made them kind of difficult to play, and that came down to the string spacing at the bridge. If you didn't know, the original Pro Bridge had 55 millimeter string spacing, which is not uncommon on vintage guitars, but with the way the pros were made, that put the E strings dangerously close to the edges of the fretboard. In fact, every single one that I encountered out in the wild upon release had the E strings right on the edge of the crown of the frets, which meant no matter what you did, those strings were just falling off. Also very weird, and I'm not sure if this was just my guitar or every single one, because I didn't measure every single one, but my American Professional Bridge had a 12 inch radius, and that was mind boggling because the neck radius is nine and a half inches. So it always felt a little unwieldy to play across the fretboard. Uh, again, not something that everyone would notice, but I definitely did. Like many of Fender's other current offset models, the American Professional series featured an angled neck pocket, which does eliminate the need for shims and takes the guesswork out of setups, but there's a problem. As you've heard me say before, that much neck pitch forces the bridge and pickups to be way high off the body and actually makes the guitars feel incredibly stiff when you're bending. They also have the added side effect of making it really difficult to use aftermarket hardware like a mastery or a stay trim because both of those bridges are designed to sit much lower on the body than stock. Now the American Professional Series also featured a micro tilt neck pocket adjustment, which uh, is brilliant. I honestly think that every bolt on neck guitar should have a micro tilt, not just offsets, but certainly offsets. If you're not aware, the micro tilt is essentially a mechanical way to adjust the amount of pitch back you have on your neck just by turning a screw. You can do that without taking the strings off, without taking the neck off, you can do it at tension. However, with an angled neck pocket, you guessed it, the micro tilt is completely redundant. And I don't understand why they included both because on literally every single American Pro that I have worked on, I have never had to engage the micro tilt. Now, 
the pickups. The original V-Mod series pickups were the biggest and most disappointing surprise of them all. I'm here to say it, V-Mod pickups are not Jazzmaster pickups. They are in fact identical to the Japanese pickups that so many of us toss out of our MIJ and CIJ guitars as soon as we get them. They are tall coils in an oversized bob and basically an overwound strap pickup masquerading as a Jazzmaster. They are dull and muddy and disappointing and I do not like them at all. They have neither the sound nor the appearance of flat, hot Jazzmaster pickups and yeah, I just can't get along with them. Now, why would Fender do this? Well, I can only speculate, but I think that maybe it was an attempt to homogenize the sound of the line. After all, you're rolling out this brand new line, modernized takes on all of your flagship models. It makes some logical sense that you'd want them all to have a shared tonal touchstone. But at the end of the day, if I'm buying a Jazzmaster with Jazzmaster pickups, why would I want one that didn't have the Jazzmaster sound? So how did I respond to these? Well, reeling in my disappointment, I took to the blog that I kept over at mmguitarbar.com and I wrote a series of articles and made a series of Instagram posts detailing my findings, my thoughts, my impressions, you know, as you do. And it's not that I was looking for an opportunity to bite the hand that feeds, it's just that I love Fender as a company and when I see perhaps some missteps, I would like to call them out in the hopes that things can be improved. And I wanna be clear, it's not like I'm saying the original pros are the worst guitars ever made. I, no hyperbole necessary. I think there's a really good guitar in there. I just felt that execution was sloppy at best. Now, after my articles dropped, the pro line soldiered on, but thankfully with a few mid-run tweaks. Fender slimmed down that string spacing to 53 millimeters, which made the new ones a lot easier to play. In the end, I tried like hell to love my American Pro guitar, but with so many other jazz masters in my collection that do the thing I want them to, it ended up languishing in its case, rarely being taken out for practice or recording sessions. And even at those recording sessions, the engineers would look at me midway through and say, can you try a different guitar? Like nobody liked the sound I was getting out of those pros. And in the end, I traded it and it's admittedly very nice case, for a Japanese bass six, which I loved and did some recording with, and then eventually sold off to another owner. After some time, the pros, well, they started disappearing from stores and eventually were officially discontinued in 2020. But I was starting to hear rumors, especially from sources at Fender, that the line was coming back with some big changes and that really excited me. What excited me more was that I heard that my articles that I wrote were actually central to those changes. Now I'm not privy to the machinations of the Fender Corp. I have no idea what goes on behind closed doors, yet I am told 
that the design team used my articles as a roadmap of sorts, what they got wrong and what needed to be improved. Honestly, I'm so proud of that, but also at the same time, it's like, come on, hire me. Now, rumors of the American Professional 2, which I am holding right here, started circulating in the fall of 2020 with leaked listings all but confirming our suspicions. From those screenshots and leaked listings, we could see some of the more obvious changes. First, the color lineup was tweaked. We have the beautiful Dark Knight finish, which I am a big fan of, as well as Miami Blue and Mystic Surf, which are two of my favorites from the line. The guitar was also offered in Sunburst and a color called Mercury, I believe, which is sort of um, a mocha bordered silver burst. Second, what's that? And the upper horn? Well, it looked like a rhythm circuit. It's not a rhythm circuit, but it looks like a rhythm circuit, and that was enough to get me even more excited. Obvious changes aside, there was really no telling what else was going on under the hood. Okay, jeez. <sighs> Would you look at that? So. I bided my time, I bit my tongue, and I waited for them to hit stores. Embargoes soon lifted, and the model was officially released on October 13th of 2020, followed by, to my mind, one of Fender's first experimentations with the whole media blitz thing. Every influencer, every guitar shop, every, every one of my friends actually, every one of my friends got one before I did, and I, I was a little bit hurt by that Fender. I was like, where is mine? But the good news was that on that very day, October 13th of 2020, my good friend Ryan at 60 Cycle Hum invited me on a live stream while he dissected his own American Professional 2 to see what made it tick. And there were some surprises lurking. Most interesting were the pickups. The other interesting change, the Panorama Vibrato. Panorama Vibrato is, to my mind, the first substantive update to the Leo Fender design since 1958. Yes, of course, AVRIs use different materials, springs are a little weaker to accommodate lighter string gauges, uh, and we've got imports of varying quality from, you know, China and Indonesia. 
you know, we've got the MIJ and CIJ vibratos, which are also different on their own. But as far as a US made component from Fender, this is the first thing they've changed in a long, long time. The Panorama promised a dramatically increased range of pitch, and from Ryan's demos, yeah, you could almost dive bomb this thing. In fact, Ryan asked me to test my vibratos against his, measuring how my own 61, 63, and Mastery vibratos compared with the new Panorama. And the findings, well, they were very impressive to say the least. Whereas the 61 patent pending on Pancake can only detune about to C sharp on a good day, the Panorama can go all the way down to F sharp below E standard. This is a shocking amount of travel for a non-locking Jazzmaster style vibrato. I mean, do I ever really want a dive bomb? Not really, but it's nice to have the option, especially if it stays in tune. This increased range of pitch is all thanks to the designer's choice to move the pivot point forward a little bit as compared with Leo's stock design. The pivot mechanism itself has been completely redesigned as compared with Leo Fender's original pivot plate. But you know what? If the panorama works as described, then I'm all in. Having that increased range just adds to the bevy of interesting sounds that I can make on a Jazzmaster, and I think that's great. However, I would later discover that that was a very big if. My first spin on a Pro 2 came in late September when my good friend Vanessa brought hers over. That's right, Vanessa got one. But the real reason that Vanessa brought her guitar over was not just for a setup, but because the panorama didn't work, like at all. Yo, this is super weird. So Vanessa, you asked me uh, to get the arm up off the body because uh, as you pointed out, it was incredibly low on the body and you couldn't dip. So I adjusted it the way you always adjust these things using the spring tension adjustment and now it doesn't move at all. Anytime she demonstrated it, she would actuate the vibrato and it would just terminate with a plunk as soon as she touched the arm. That was worrisome. When I encounter a problem on a guitar, I have a series of questions that I ask to help me determine what might be going on, to narrow down my range of search. And so I asked Vanessa what was going on and she told me that it worked fine until she installed 11s. I thought maybe it just needed adjustments, so I did what you always do when a Jazzmaster vibrato isn't performing the way you want, and I tried adjusting the spring tension screw. It also doesn't work. I, I'm so confused. I mean, this has no range. Did it have any range when you were playing it? I, I can't get this thing to work. No matter where I had this thing adjusted, the arm would not move. I could pull up plenty, but going down was impossible. I don't do that. Now it seemed to me that perhaps the spring they used just couldn't handle the increased tension of heavier string gauges, but I didn't have a really good way to test that at the time. And so I did the sensible thing and I reached out to my friends at Fender. I sent them videos, I sent them questions, and I said, hey, I think I may have found a problem with the panorama. I am here with Vanessa's American Pro 2 Jazzmaster, and I have a question about the vibrato, being that this is my first hands-on experience here. Uh, her vibrato doesn't seem to have any anywhere near the range that the panorama trim is supposed to have. It basically bottoms out immediately, and it's right now it's set up with the trim lock working as intended, and 11s, and this thing just it just bottoms out immediately. And here I am with the vibrato arm, about where it was when Vanessa first brought it to me. The arm is very close to the guard and she couldn't really use it without knocking her hand. However, again, it's just bottoming out and I'm super confused. Uh, I've looked at the assembly and it looks just like the one that Ryan showed me on stream. Uh, nothing appears to be different about it, but Again, I don't know, I'm, I'm just really confused. And once again, plenty of upward travel, but it just will not go down. I didn't hear back from Fender for quite a long time. And when I finally did get a response, well, it wasn't as helpful as I'd hoped. They simply assumed I didn't know how to adjust to Jazzmaster, and I'm not the kind of guy to be like, do you know who I am? But this is that one time where I was like, are you kidding me? And so without a proper solution, I handed the guitar back to the Vanessa, albeit set up a lot better. 
and life went on. This issue would occupy my thoughts for well over a year. I would constantly revisit what was going on with the vibrato and try to think of solutions, but I really couldn't come up with any because due to supply chain issues and the pandemic itself, these were really hard to come by. I don't think I saw another American Pro 2 until this one showed up. Uh, and in the meantime, I had dozens of people reach out to me asking if their guitar was defective or if they messed something up because their vibrato didn't work at all. And in every single one of those cases, these people were using strings heavier than tens. In the meantime, I wanted to make a post. I wanted to make a video about panorama problems. And in fact, if you look at my old videos, you can see the, uh, the Fender wiring diagram behind me and it says panorama problems with a question mark behind it because I had been thinking about it so intently. However, without a solution or really a true understanding of the problem, I didn't feel like I could offer any hope. I'd basically be responding to people like, hey, I know about this issue. I told Fender, I, I don't know how to help right now. And that just didn't feel hopeful. So it wasn't until mid-September of 2021 when this one showed up that I finally got my chance to dissect the vibrato and figure out what was going on. Just like I said, this stupid thing doesn't work with 11s. Okay, I'm, I'm laying fully on the couch. This is the culprit. It's the original American Pro Spring. And look how much I can just, oh my God, compress this. Ah, get off my stomach. With just my hand pressure, or whatever that's called, my claw. And as if the proof isn't always in the pudding, we just swapped in one of Jake's uh, vintage springs, probably from like a 63 vibrato, something like uh, that. Actually it was a December 63. He doesn't really know that for sure, but it's this one. But now we have all the range is back. It's a weak ass spring. Now folks always seem to be mystified by what exactly is going on under the hood of a jazz master vibrato because the internals are hidden away, they're out of view, it's impossible to see. However, thanks to my good friends at guitarmill.com, 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 thank you Ryan, I am gonna be able to show you exactly what's going on with the jazz master vibrato thanks to this little feature. I cut this body up. <laughs> this, was, this was a mistake body that Ryan from Guitar Mill sent me and it is the exact right way to show you the problem of the panorama vibrato. With the stock nine gauge strings and the trem lock feature working as intended, the panorama does indeed have an impressive range of motion. You can see here how the new pivot mechanism works and just how far the string anchor plate travels. With nine gauge strings, the vibrato works exactly as promised. Stepping up to 10 to 46, the vibrato actually does lose just a little bit of range with added string tension. It's not quite as noticeable as with heavier strings, but you can see here that the spring is far more compressed than it was with nines. This does not bode well for heavier string gauges. And sure enough, when we have the vibrato strung with 11s, you can see that this thing just does not want to move. With that modified and moved pivot point, the spring is so heavily compressed that it loses almost all of its range. Now let's have a look at the springs. Here we've got the Pro Spring, the spring from a 63 vibrato, thank you Jake, and the spring from a Mastery. The Mastery spring is super stiff. It's tough to compress even with arm pressure. And the same goes for the 63, although it is a little bit easier to move. The spring of the Panorama though, I could do this all day. Compared to the others, it was effortless. And according to the parts manifests, 
This is the very same spring which has been used in American vintage vibrato units for years. So for that same spring which works so well with heavier gauges in the AVRI vibratos to then not work well at all in the panorama, it's got to come down to the additional force placed on the spring by the modified and moved pivot mechanism. Just gotta do it the right way, Jay. All right, and to further prove my point, I am here with my best friend Jake's uh, Fiesta Red Dave's AVRI AV62 American Vintage 62. What the hell is it again? It's a December 63. It's fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not. He doesn't know that. Stop saying it. <laughs> American Vintage 62 limited edition something something something. It's brand new. It rules. I love it very much. It's a lot like R2. But I have gone to the lengths of putting the original American Pro Spring into his American Vintage Vibrato, and wouldn't you know it... This vibrato can go all the way from E down to C, proving that the Pro Spring actually works really well in the American Vintage Vibrato unit, but really has troubles with the modified pivot point on the panorama. It's not really the spring's fault, it's the added pressure of that pivot mechanism. Honestly and truly, the spring used on the Professional 2 is just too weak to handle increased string tension. I can't say definitively that every Pro 2 Jazz Master out there is going to exhibit this issue, but it seems to me that a lot of them do. And believe it or not, just as I was about to wrap editing on this very video, I got yet another Instagram DM from a Panorama owner who has this same problem. So if you're the kind who likes to use the heavier gauges that I always recommend for offset guitars, the Panorama may not be a good choice for you. That's not to say you should avoid the whole guitar, but as a stated feature of the model, it just does not work as promised. But if you like 9s or even 10 to 46, you're probably going to be okay. At the end of the day, whether intentionally or not, Fender seems to have designed a vibrato to work specifically with 9-gauge strings. And again, I can sort of see the logic in that. In 1957-58, Leo Fender was working on the Jazzmaster, and he designed these guitars to work with these super heavy flat-wound strings that were so common at the time. So maybe Fender intentionally swung the pendulum the other way, or maybe it was an oversight, I don't know. All I do know is that to get the vibrato functioning correctly in this video, I replaced the spring with the one from my spare mastery. So as you're watching the demos and I'm using the vibrato, just keep that in mind that it's not the stock spring. I do want to note that I have recently reached out to Fender with my findings and Actually, they were really receptive. I'm told that they are indeed working on solutions, whether they'll replace the spring or include a different one, I don't know. But Fender knows about this and they are working hard to improve it. But hey, maybe it's time to reissue those old carbon steel springs, huh? Thank you. 
So we've taken a long time to get to this point of the review, and you're probably asking yourself, well, does he even like this thing? And the answer is yes. Vibrato aside, oh, I honestly love this thing. I think it's one of Fender's best modern jazz masters to date. It is a world of difference when compared with the Pro One. It is a much more versatile and exciting guitar, and I'm having a blast. Where I found the original model to be uninspiring and tonally dull, to be honest, the Pro 2 is far more exciting, it's far more tuneful, it's got way more sounds on board than I ever would have imagined, and overall a lot more in line with what I would expect on a more modern take on the Jazzmaster design. Let's talk specs. The Fender American Pro 2 Jazzmaster features a 25 and a half inch scale maple neck with a gloss poly headstock and a satin poly finish on the back of the neck. It's silky, it's smooth, it's easy to play. The neck profile is a modern C shape that's fast and slim all the way up the neck and the measurements are on screen for your edification. The headstock wears a set of die cast staggered tuners as well as a modernized string tree and truss rod axis is also at the headstock, meaning that you don't have to take the neck off to make any adjustments. The attractive rosewood fretboard features 22 instead of the usual 21 rather large frets. The alder body is finished in the glorious polyurethane dark night finish, which is basically a metallic black with a metallic blue border. It also has blacked out plastics, including the pick guard, the pickup covers, the switch tip, and the witch hat knobs. For pickups, we've got a set of V-Mod 2s in here, basically the same neck pickup that came in the original Professionals, as well as a new bridge pickup that is coil tapped, allowing you to select two different output levels. It's still a coil wound around rod magnets, just like any other Fender style pickup. However, the coil is then finished and then more wire is added to it, allowing you via the push-push knob to select two levels of output, what they're calling a vintage and a modern setting. Now that, I love to see it. Something new from the factory, something exciting, something you're not really gonna get from other manufacturers. I, I just love that Fender took a chance here. Electronics are two 500K pots, and instead of a rhythm circuit, we have a series parallel switch and two one meg volume and tone controls for that position alone. Hardware includes a 9.5 inch radius Mustang style professional bridge, as well as the new Panorama Vibrato, which features a new push-in type arm with nylon inserts to keep it steady.
Let's run through some thoughts, shall we? Now the Pro 2 still has a poly finish, which I fully expect at this price point. But the colors are cool as all get out. I love the range of colors on this line, especially the Dark Knight finish, which, ugh, I just can't get enough of it. The Pro 2 still has a poly finish, which is to be expected in this price range. And I have to say that it doesn't really bother me as much as it once did. I used to participate in the nitro versus poly debate all the time, and I have to say that in my old age, I really don't care if a guitar has a poly finish. What I care about is how thick that finish is, and I gotta say, as far as unplugged sounds, I don't feel like this guitar is lacking at all. Tuners. Fender is still using these staggered die-cast tuners that they've been using for a while, and I have to say they're not my favorite. They work fine, but personally, I would vastly prefer to see a set of uh, Goto on here. Those split shaft tuners are fantastic. I never ever feel the need to change them. I would take them any day over these, especially the staggered ones. Most staggered tuner sets out there have three heights, uh, whereas the fenders only have two. The E and A are very tall and allow you to wrap a lot more string around the shaft, but the D, G, B, and E are really short and kind of restrictive. And as I wind the string, it forces the string into the bushing, and so it feels not great, uh, especially when I'm tuning. So this is something I would change. Compare that to the headstock of my Shelton called 3PO, which does have staggered tuners, but there are three heights on there and it feels a lot more natural to use. At the end of the day, I just don't like a tuner that dictates how much string I can wrap around it. So yeah, I'm gonna be changing these as soon as I can. Now, the next shape I love. It feels very different from my 17 and is a lot slimmer as well. I will flash those measurements on the screen again for your edification but this is a much more comfortable guitar to play. Uh, do I wish the nut were skinnier? Yes, yes I do, but I will spare you that complaint. It is 1 and 11 sixteenths, that's pretty standard for every guitar out there, so if you're used to modern Fender, well this should feel right at home for you. Uh, let's talk about the frets. I actually don't mind them as much as I thought I would. I'm not into big frets, and these, these are substantial. I'm bending easily. But as I've gotten used to the guitar, I've also gotten used to the frets and they don't really bother me at all anymore. It's a very professional thing to put on your guitar. As for the 22nd, it's kind of nice to have the high D. I like having it there. It's never been an issue for me to only have 21 because if I want to get that D, I will just bend up to it. So I could give or take. I also want to point out that this guitar does in fact have the micro tilt neck adjustment, but the neck pocket is still angled, so it's barely usable. Honestly, I don't remember the exact measurement of the angled pocket on my first American Professional, but on this one, I measured it at one degree. Now, I do have the micro tilt just barely engaged on this guitar to lower the action above the 12th fret, but it's only a fraction of a turn. So again, I'm not really sure why it's even included on this model. Uh, one or the other is plenty, but I would prefer a flat pocket and a micro tilt. Speaking of adjustment, the vibrato also allows you to adjust how much swing your arm has. And mine's a little bit loose right now. I'll probably fix that soon. But the collet housing into which the arm is inserted does have an Allen key adjustment, which allows you to choose how stiff that arm feels as you move it in and out of position. This is a fantastic addition to the Panorama Vibrato, and it's good to have it. Curiously, also something that Mastery has offered for years at this point, so do with that information as you will. Now, those nylon bridge inserts from the original Pro Series are back on the Pro 2, and they are meant to keep the bridge from rocking. Now, I did remove them from my guitar for the purposes of my own playing joy and comfort, uh, but thankfully they're removable, they're easy to put back in, so if you've got one, try it with and without, see which way works best for you. Under the guard, the wiring is a little bit of a mess. It's hastily constructed and, you know, functional still, but that's something I would like to see cleaned up in future releases.
Now, with all the time I have spent with this guitar, I still have to admit that the pickups just are not doing it for me. They are a little muddy, a little too hot. Are they my favorite Jazzmaster pickups ever? No. Do they make a sound that is usable? Absolutely. They really do sound like strap pickups to my ear, and I will be replacing them as soon as I possibly can with a set that I got from Novec, specifically the JM90 and the JM180. And the 180 will still allow me to have that boost when I need it, um, but otherwise uh, a pickup that I will just like a lot better. And while having the tapped pickup feature is really exciting for me, I want to say that I, I feel like the switch is backward. With the stock wiring, the down position is the modern or the full pickup, and up is the vintage sound, and I feel like that should be the other way around, that I should have the vintage sound down, and I should click it when I want to boost. Uh, again, that may be nitpicky, but that's something that I will probably be changing sooner rather than later. As I said before, the guitar boasts a pair of 500k pots, which uh, is different from the stock one meg configuration on proper jazz masters and so I am missing a little bit of that treble snap and bite so at some point I may change those as well although it is exceedingly difficult to find one meg push pull or push push pots so I might be out of luck. I will say however that the treble bleed on the volume here is fantastic and lets all of your sound through when you roll back the volume. Uh, I would like to see that implemented on every guitar. I think it's perfect. Uh, well done, Fender. This is a series parallel switch that puts both pickups in series and activates a pair of roller knobs, both one meg, for volume and tone only in that position. Now, it's a great sound, and although I don't really often need a series position, it's nice to have it. The one thing I will say is that because these are both one meg, well, as soon as I activate this, I kind of miss the one megs that are not present in the lead circuit. It feels a little imbalanced to me, so uh, you may not notice that, but that's something that does stick out to me. And I want to say also that I don't mind not having the rhythm circuit on this. Uh, I thought I would miss it a lot more than I do, but because I have other guitars with a proper rhythm circuit, I don't know, it's kind of nice to have something different. So. It doesn't really bother me. It probably won't bother you. It's not something that you need to worry about if you're considering a Pro 2 of your own. And finally, we come to the conclusion you have all been waiting for. Do I recommend the American Professional 2? Yeah, yeah, I do wholeheartedly. It's a hell of a guitar uh, for not a lot of money. Well, actually, it's more money now. Fender did actually just raise the price on these $200. And $200 doesn't sound like a lot, but they were previously $15.99 
and are now going for $17.99, and that makes it a little tricky. I still recommend it, but it feels like this guitar is approaching a completely different price point now. And if you're shopping for a guitar that's approaching 2K, it feels like you could just save up a little bit more and get the more vintage correct model. So it does become a little difficult to figure out exactly where this fits in now. That almost feels like I'm taking psychic damage by Fender announcing a price change. I don't like the guitar any less, and like I said, this one was sent to me, so bear that in mind. But would I pay 18? I'm just gonna twirl this for six minutes while I consider my words carefully. Well, now I feel conflicted and I thought I had it all wrapped up. I can be honest. If you can find one for the old price, if you can find one used, go for it. And hell, you're probably gonna like the pickups a lot more than me. That's, that's just me only working on and playing Jazz Masters for over a decade of my life. I know what they should sound like and these don't work for me, but aftermarket pickups, they're widely available. There are so many options out there. I don't think that's a strike against the guitar because I do that to every guitar. I've done that to my 61. So yeah, pickups aren't a deal breaker for me. The vibrato thing may be a deal breaker. I'm gonna live with this mastery spring for a while, but at some point I'm gonna want my mastery vibrato back. And what do I do at that point? So I really hope that Fender comes out with a solution for that issue. Now, if I hear anything, I'll let you know. All in all, I think this is a really great instrument and I think Fender did a good job of expanding and tweaking the Jazzmaster ethos just enough that this guitar feels natural, feels like a, a welcome addition to the offset lineup. And uh, I'm really excited to mod this thing. In fact, hey, you let me know, which do you like better? Do you like the deco boom that I have, which I'm, I'm actually really excited about. I think this is the way I'm gonna go. Or should I go gold on this guy? It matches the headstock pretty well, but uh, I don't know. Is this too old fashioned for a pro? I don't know. I gotta think about it some more. But as soon as I can, I'm gonna make some cosmetic and tonal changes, and I think I'm gonna end up using the heck out of this guitar. Well, that about wraps up the world's longest guitar video <laughs> ever. Uh, I, have, I have been looking forward to this and I've also been dreading it because I don't know if anyone's gonna watch all this, but I had to, I just had to do it to him. There was no way around doing a double review. So the American Pro one, I don't recommend. I don't really like them. If you like them, that's great. The Pro two, I am all about. Well, look, I've talked for too long. I'm gonna trade my American Pro two for a slice of delicious red velvet birthday cake because it, it was my birthday this week. I turned 40 and um, wow. <laughs> well, it's all downhill from here, friends. I'm gonna finish this because I've been a very good boy, but before I go, I wanna say thank you so much for watching, for coming back to the channel again and again, for liking, for sharing, for commenting, for subscribing, for doing all of that good stuff that keeps the algorithm happy, especially as we have Stop producing videos quite as often. It feels so good that you all keep making me feel welcome on this platform. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> but I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and each other. And I'll see you in the next, possibly shorter video.
I'm 40.